Well, everybody, please welcome Maggie Robertson back to the show. Oren the Red herself. How are you? I'm good. How are you? <laughs> very, very well. Tell us, before we get started, how, how has your life changed since that iconic Lady D role a few years back? Um, My <laughs> life has changed in every way. <laughs> um, this is a much bigger question, I think, than you were intending. I don't, I really genuinely don't think there is not a single aspect of my life that was left untouched by that character. Wow. That. Um, it really, this is not an over-exaggeration, but it, it created a career for me essentially overnight. And then I was able to just launch into an, an area of the industry that I had previously not been exposed to in a real, 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 real and immediate way. Um, so it's been really exciting. It was way more than I ever expected to come out of that role. Uh, so it's been really exciting and been such a joy to witness all of the different things that are now accessible, all of the different opportunities that I now have available to me. That's really what is exciting about it. Was it was it hard as well because the fandom was so huge and then when it started to die down naturally, um, what was that like for you going from such a high? Did it die down? <laughs> Well, well, maybe it didn't. I'm asking. Yeah, I, I mean, I've <laughs> never seen someone do so many signings as you. It, you must hold the record for strength. Oh, that was a lot. <laughs> that was a lot. They were very fun, but I, you're right. I was just at a certain point at the end there was just trying to get through everything. And that's <laughs> when it starts to become a little less fun. I always want to approach what I do with joy. And oh, I appreciate your honesty. When you're yeah. just like head down to the grind, I have to get these finished so they can get out to people. The quality is different. You're just like, oh God, this is the job. Got to finish it. Bah, 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 bah. Um, yeah. But yeah, I don't know. I also try very hard to keep a healthy amount of distance between myself and the internet. No, yeah, yeah. I'm, yeah. I mean, I have a social media, I'm pretty active on there, but I try not to look too deep, I guess, is the answer to that question. I look at my page and I don't look at anything anywhere else. And uh, then that's it. Yeah. You can all stay happy. But I mean, it's, it is a life-changing role. I mean, you must be, you still must look back. I, I look back at it nostalgic now, those years. And I know it's not that long ago, but. In our very first interview together. <laughs> Oh, it was so much I think fun. you were one of the first that I did. Oh, I appreciate you doing that mm -hmm. as well. Thank you. And before we started recording or filming, I was berating you for not singing me a song this time. You had a Lady <laughs> D song that you were that you sang. Lady <laughs> Dometresque. <laughs> You're simply <laughs> the best. Nine foot tall. No, Impressed well, that you found yeah. anything to rhyme with Demi <laughs> even like adjacently rhyming. <laughs> oh, no, we got to talk about this new character in Baldur's Gate. I yeah. mean, I, I I, can't believe this is you. This is psychotic. Mm -hmm. This is disturbing. This is unbelievable. I know you've got a Shakespeare background, but, I mean, wow. Talk us through it. Oh, this process was so different from Lady D in every single way. Um, the turnaround for me was quite quick. I think I auditioned, had a callback, and then was notified that I booked and told that I have to fly out to London within the span of a week. So the prep window was so small. It was essentially me prepping on the flight over. Are you prepared for that? Are you, how do you... Well, that's why you put in your 10,000 hours, right? You've yeah. done the work in advance to know how to work quickly to get avenues in on a character. So I had to work very quickly, but I also trusted that I had the groundwork behind me, the foundation behind me to support having to work and make very quick choices. You also have a lot of trust in your team. I've said this a million times, but actors have such a small portion of the big picture I'm, I have a very narrow focus. I only know what is happening with my character and I rely on the dev team and the voice directors and the cinematic directors that I'm working with to help guide me in the direction that we need to go in order to support the narrative as a whole. Um, 
And that's very important to me. I always feel like as an actor, I really value collaboration and I love environments where I have a team that fosters that. And Larian Studios very much fosters that. I felt like they were so supportive in, in willing just to let me, let's, let's just throw a bunch of paint at the wall and see what sticks. We did a lot of tests of like, let's find exactly where Oren needs to fall on the spectrum of psychotic you know <laughs> let's find exactly where that line is so where was that line of Maggie? <laughs> let me just say this they did tell me to rein it in <laughs> did they <laughs> they did have to pull me back I love where that. they were like cool you that. dialed it up to 11 let's bring it right back down. <laughs> i'd love to see that footage i'll tell you oh, what oh man i don't know if it exists but no, it's it probably doesn't, pretty hilarious but... it's pretty funny what were the um what were the conversations like with the the writer in, in Ooh, crafting this character? Those were really valuable to me, I think. Again, because I had such a small preparation window. Then when I actually got on to set and was in the volume, to have access to the writer, you don't always have that. So to have access to Adrian Law was really special. And it was clear in our conversations how much she cares about this character. I think this is true across all areas of the creative industry that when you are creating a character, especially villain, quote unquote, villainous characters, yeah. you, you can't judge them. You have to approach them with a sense of love and compassion. I think you have to fall in love with them a little bit. So the conversations we had were really exciting because we were both coming into it from that position of love and feeling like Oren, at least in my opinion, I, I very much feel like Oren is broken. She's almost like this broken little girl. There's something that was twisted within her and she had a horrific upbringing. If people have gotten to those points in the game, she had a really hard upbringing. All she has ever known throughout the course of her life is death. That's the only parameter that she has to uh, understand the world around her. So there's, we approached it from a huge element of compassion in that sense of just trying to understand what exactly it is that makes her like this and what are the things that are important to her? Where does she, what is love to her? Does she feel love? You know, um, all those kinds of things. So yeah, she's a special one. And and you know that scene where you go again and again and again, and it's and it really you're really crumbling, as you say the the line. When you when you do scenes like that, when when it's over, what what are you doing? How are you decompressing? What are you? I'm curious because that's there are intense some intense scenes there. There are. Mm. I think that's an excellent question. In this case, it was such a condensed timeline. And I was so jet lagged <laughs> oh, <right. 'Cause laughs> for better I, or for worse. Yeah. But I think the jet lag allowed me to really switch it off the second wow. we got because I had nothing left. But I think that's a trend for me. I really try hard to leave it all on the floor. And then, and then there's, I have no regrets about what I could have possibly given. So I really pushed myself quite hard. Um, so then after filming, I would just go back to the hotel room and fall asleep and then wake <laughs> up and do it all again. Um, but it's intensive. You're dealing with a lot of really big and heavy emotions. What I think is interesting about villains and perhaps our fascination with villains. Now, it seems like we're kind of leaning away from our typical hero structure and we're empathizing and relating more to or being interested more in these anti-heroes or these villains there's something maybe about villains that allow us as audiences and also as performers to have safe access to emotions and experiences that we would not allow ourselves to have so it can feel a little cathartic and it's it's within a very set and safe parameter nothing about this is happening outside of this fictionalized world. Yeah. Um, so I always find it quite cathartic, but it's exhausting for sure. It's exhausting. Those are big emotions. She feels big, big things. And then afterwards you do kind of have to take care of yourself and make sure you're getting rest because at the end of the day, you have to wake up and do it all again. That's the performer's 
thing. You gotta, you gotta be able to do it again. When you, when you hit that hotel room, are you still thinking about the character and what you're going to have to do the next day? Or do you leave it behind when you walk through the door? I, I didn't do anything else the night that I got back because I would be just so tired, but I Mm. would wake up earlier in the mornings and I'd go down and have breakfast and I'd have the script in front of me. And I'd kind of, I didn't know exactly what lines we'd be doing that day, but I would kind of look a bit more forward thinking at the lines. This is also sometimes some of the first times I'm seeing them and breaking down the structure, where are the beats, where are the shifts? Oren in particular, one of the first things I noticed about her, in fact, when I got the script, even in the auditions, was her dexterity of thought. She jumps so quickly from point A to point B. So then my job as an actor was to create that connective tissue between those thoughts and make sense of, of her line of reasoning and her logic. So that was the work that I did in the mornings. I would do that over a cup of tea. Orange juice, bacon, (laughs) (laughs) fortify myself for the day's work ahead. And then also in the car, I'd be kind of like muttering her lines under my breath, which I'm sure made me look like a complete. (laughs) The driver's body. What is that? The driver's doing in there. (laughs) And also the words that she's saying, they're not nice. It's a lot of really graphic (laughs) language that I'm just like, slaughter, blood, blood. There was um, a word in there that I'd actually had to look up. I'd never heard of it. What was it? Oh, I can't remember it now. Spite something, Sprite. Oh, I can't think of it. It'll come to me. No. But spite. the writing is phenomenal. Spite and Sprite are both <laughs> words. <laughs> yeah, no. I don't know if that's the one you're thinking of. Those. <laughs> I cannot remember for the life of me, but it was um, the writing, as you said, is just brilliant across the oh, board yeah. on this game. I mean, unreal. Yeah, she feels very unique to me as a character as a whole, but also within this game, the fact that she's a shapeshifter lends itself to so much creative fun. I think that was, oh. that must have been so fun to figure out, okay, how can we insert Oren into different situations and use her as a tool to test and toy with the players uh, so she's she's very disconcerting. You never know when she's gonna show up. But she enjoys it, Maggie. She enjoys it. Exactly. <laughs> that, that is what's so terrifying about her. And I think as I was diving into text, I quickly realized that in order to make sense of how quickly she jumps between thoughts, that it had to feel almost playful, a little bit more light. And so you're right that part of the what's so terrifying about her is that she is saying things that are so gruesome and so horrific and violent, but with an attitude of glee and joy, it's fun for her. She, that's, she gets so much pleasure out of it. And that is what is so terrifying. And it's such an interesting and evil uh, juxtaposition to have someone approaching violence with such lightness and yet still be committing some of the most gruesome atrocities you've ever seen yeah i i and you mentioned before you know with the with the orange juice looking over the lines and preparing i'm wondering was there a particular uh, sort of scene that that stuck out to you and you were kind of apprehensive about it nervous or were you was there one that sort of as you were going along oh okay i'm gonna have to watch out for this scene i don't know Mm. if there was i don't remember it okay I mean, a lot of this, I was learning the context yeah. when I was in the booth because I only have my lines in front of me. So I, I didn't have a chance right. to get in my head about, oh, she's doing this to X, Y, Z or blah, 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 blah. Um, I learned that as we went. But yeah, I think certainly the stakes of how can I pull off a character it's quite challenging, I think, to play a character that is unpredictable, that is a little bit more of this chaotic evil quality because their thoughts move so quickly. So you have to shift your beats as an actor so quickly. And it's effective if you do it well, it, it's very effective. And that was what I was attempting to do with Oren a lot of making choices within the line that 
constantly flip the line on its head and make an unexpected choice the player doesn't see coming so that there's always this unnerving sense of discomfort around Oren. You can never get comfortable when you're around her because you don't know what she's going to do I next. I couldn't get comfortable around the normal characters because she could pop up <laughs> at any moment. Well, exactly. You. Yeah, you can't oh, get comfortable when you're anxiety. not with Oren. You can't get comfortable uh. when you're with Oren. <laughs> She's a wild card and she definitely will take the players on quite the roller coaster. Yeah. And and tell me what's the difference between walking in to Resident Evil first day mocap versus walking into this first day. What's the difference for you? Resident Evil was my very first time doing any form of performance capture whatsoever. There was a lot of nerves those first day. It was like doing a first day at school and yeah. you have those jitters and all you want to do is not fall flat on your face. And everyone, I think on set did a really great job of welcoming me in. Neil Newbon was one of my crossovers who's also in Baldur's Gate 3 as a Starian. Legend. And I think he literally, legend, I mean, literally, but he was actually, I think the first person I met when I walked on to set first on the first day um, and was so generous about his time and resources and is, a, is he's just an outgoing and generous he's person. He's always championed you, Maggie. Yeah. Oh, yeah. well, okay. Well, that's just because he's amazing. But uh, yeah, <laughs> no, he, I mean, he really was a, definitely a mentor for me throughout that process because he has so much mocap experience. And then, then the second he learned that I, this is my first time, it was like, oh, amazing. Um, here's everything and the whole cast did that as well yeah. um so it was a really lovely working experience and larian's the same way quite honestly i really loved it was a lot more intimate because it was just me in the mocap booth and then me and the directors that i was working with so much smaller unit i was not getting to interact with the other cast members did you have jk but or, or jason in your ears Oh, in my ears. In okay, ears. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, that was what was so <laughs> exciting about it. Uh, maybe those are the scenes that I anticipated the most because I was like, oh my God, I'm going to be <laughs> against these icons and these wow. titans of the industry. Yeah. And I hope that I just meet them <laughs> where they're at. And uh, oh, yeah, definitely fall short. But oh, no. yeah, so they had all gone in to record their lines prior to me going in to record mine and do the mocap. Um, so when we were doing those scenes, I got to hear what flavors they were bringing to the character, which is always cool because then you get to be like, oh, oh, that's who Kethrick is. That's who Gortash is. Then Oren might react like this, this, or this. And you can kind of flesh out the internal dynamics and politics within their triumvirate uh, as well. That's what's exciting. Relationships are exciting. So when you know what the other person is doing, it's always helpful. It's always helpful. That's why when you're doing self tapes, it's a little, you're acting with yourself and you're having to imagine what somebody else is doing. But when you have a body in the room with you that you're reacting off of, mm -hmm. our bodies communicate information between each other that's nonverbal. So you're picking up something, even if it's not explicitly being said to you, you're receiving information and responding to that information. So and it's that's exciting. exactly why, that's exactly why AI won't work and taking over acting. That's one of the main reasons, in my opinion, what you just said. Yeah. I think so too. I mean, I think AI is a very useful tool. It's a tool that has been used in video games for quite some time. So it's not going anywhere, but in terms of it being used to replicate and generate performance, mm. I think in the end, the human component is, is what is going to win out because there is we operate very instinctually. Our bodies yeah. have knowledge and have understanding, even if our brains aren't aware of it. And I think that's what's going to, those little moments of improv where you have an idea and you just twist a line in a different way than you expected that then branches out to all these other things. That's, that's the human element. That's what's so valuable about having people uh, performing these roles. That's why you well, hire well us said. To, to have our our generation of ideas in there as well. Well said. And going back to JK and Jason, uh, I love those scenes because all three of you are different types of evil. Yeah. 
Isn't that you know cool? What I mean? Yeah. I think they've done such a great job in the game as a whole that all of the bad guys, the villains that you need are quite distinctive from each other, which I think mm-hmm. is really exciting. 100%. Um, we've got some fan questions here. Oh, we got fine. a lot of them. So let's get through as many as we can. In your expert opinion, Maggie, can we fix her? <laughs> oh, no. Uh. <laughs> But if you truly loved her, you wouldn't want to fix her anyway, right? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, in your eyes, Maggie, is Oren more complex than simply being a murderous lunatic? What other layers to the character did you want to portray while doing the mocap? That's from Bear Gold 34. This is a deep question. We yeah, in the, There's some great questions the in here. Good trust me. stuff. Yeah. I think you're absolutely correct that that is a trap that is so easy to fall into when you're playing any type of villain, I would say. It's very easy to fall into stereotype. I think as we touched on a little bit before in this interview, it's always important as a performer and as a creative when you're working on a character not to judge them and to fall in love with them a little bit. And then if you're able to do that, I think that's what's gonna create the nuance that is beyond stereotype in your performance. If you're approaching it from that attitude of love, what's so interesting about villains is that you are always having to ask the question of why, why are they doing what they're doing? Why are they the way that they are? There's always a reason. I personally don't believe villains are born. I think they're made. So what made them into the person that they are or being that they are uh, today? So I think Oren for sure it's easier to fall into that trap. I'd say she's very mm. tempting to do that with, but what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> Where am I going? The layers, the the layers of the while recording. What were you trying to portray? Right. Yeah. Right. 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 Awesome. <laughs> Great. Good talk. Uh, I'm a smart actor. Um, the layers, the layers. She's like onions. Onions. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yes. So I think it comes back to understanding her backstory, understanding her relationship to things. She's only known death. She's only known death and violence. She literally had to kill or be killed in order to survive. That's a key foundational part of her personality and why she views the world in the way that she views it today. The only paternal figure that she's had in her life is a murderous God. So those are the examples that she's had. I think the complexities come into this kind of tension. Once I, I think once I found the tension between her playfulness and then the actual acts that she's committing and the words that she's saying, that kind of juxtaposition of something so joyous and gleeful next to something so horrific is what makes her so interesting and that was kind of the key in for me once I found that kind of childlike playfulness around her use of language. Um, Yeah, I think her relationship to violence is different than other villains we've seen in the past as well. Again, Mm. we've kind of touched on this, but it's violence for her is a form of self-expression. It's a form of worship. It's a form of pleasure. It's not fueled by rage or aggression unlike a lot of other villains lady d for instance i think her violence is fueled by rage and aggression and actually a really deep capacity for hurt and love i think her actions throughout the game are ultimately defined by her capacity for love because once her daughters get murdered spoilers uh (laughs) then she totally changes her objective and deviates off of mother miranda's log line of what they're supposed to be doing so that's what motivates lady d Oren is motivated by the joy of it it's it's about self-expression it's the only way that she knows how to express herself and release and all that jazz so it's a very different quality to the why what she's doing uh yeah i really wanted to integrate also this um, relationship that she has with her blades, with her weapons. It was interesting. Yeah. It was fascinating to me to think about how these things that are inanimate could feel quite real and personified to her as if they are the only 
true constants that she's ever had in her life because the rest of her life has been so volatile. Um, so those were different things that I tried to bring in and capture and integrate little small moments of movement throughout the game as well. That was a really long answer. Have I we done? I love it. I blacked out. <laughs> Great. No, that, that was really detailed. Thank you, Maggie. I, I also, um, are you longing for the day that you get to play a character similar to you? A bit more bubbly, fun, silly. <laughs> yeah, I have a lot of fun with the villains, as I think you can probably tell oh, in yeah. my performances. I find them to be quite fun because of all of the things we've already talked about. They offer very unique challenges and they allow for very big emotional expressions because they're not especially in the worlds that I've lived in that are more fantasy skewing, those are much, they're heightened worlds. So they can support heightened stakes, heightened language, big emotions. So those are very fun for me to play in for sure. But do I want to broaden my portfolio? Do I always want to be looking for new challenges? Of course, I would love to play other things. I think more, less the, so I'm less interested in playing a character that is exactly me and more interested in playing a character that is so polar opposite to all of the evil violence characters that I've played. Yeah, in the past. that's what I'd I love yeah. to be. I'd love to be a derpy little toad or just the <laughs> smallest little bean that ever existed or a grandma or. Um... I swear you did have a role like that recently, right? You had a little, was it a grandma or something? Oh, Okay. No, no, yeah. you're right. Call me out on that. Well, first yeah. of all, I um, played a game. I played a one shot of D and D at PAX East with Wizards of the Coast. Yes. Where uh, do you play D and D? Nine year old. No, I should. I really want to try it. But that yeah. surprises me quite honestly, Dan. Yeah, to, I know. It's it's my comment. friends. They're the problem. I'm ready to go. Get new ones. <laughs> they gotta go. Yeah, yeah I know. <laughs> I know. Um, um, yeah, you played a yeah, ninety eight year old. Uh, Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so she's a race called Tabaxi, which is Tabaxi. a cat race, yeah. and she's 98. So I literally was an old cat lady, and that was very <laughs> amusing to me. I had a lot of fun with her. Um, uh, and I also yeah. was that your first time, by the way. That was my first time. Oh, that was my wow. first time. Yeah. yeah. High stakes too. I was Shit. like, "Are you sure?" They reached out and they were like, "Do you want to do this?" I was like, "Are did you mean to?" You meant to reach out to me? You're, you're reaching out to me? This is not a joke. Is this a trick? It feels like a trick. I, I would have been nervous, I'll tell you. <laughs> yeah. Well, I had such a great cast of people to play off of. And yeah, I think, too, one of the reasons why I gravitate to acting, I always get a lot more nervous to speak as myself as we are doing now. I've now had a lot of practice doing that, so it's less nerve-wracking. But doing all the award shows where I had to give speeches... I Congratulations, by the wedding way. Buckets. Oh, thank I you. I did tell you thank you were going to win that. I remember I I, I swear I told you. I Come know, on. but I wasn't in a position to hear it, Dan. <laughs> God. I said, get uh, ready, Max. No, you did. That was those, fantastic. I, I was sweating. Yeah. I was sweating. I was so <laughs> nervous. I wrote out the speeches in advance. I practiced. Couldn't tell. In the you couldn't tell, honestly. Just was so nervous. But when I'm acting, I get to lose myself in somebody else. So the nerves get displaced because as long as I'm acting and working in service of the character and service of the narrative, then how can what I'm doing be wrong? So I, I find a lot of solace when I get to play other people other than myself. Um, I never get as nervous. Well, how did we get onto this? Interesting. I don't know. <laughs> so were you nervous for our first interview? Well, the first interview batch that you did or yeah. That's my first time doing any type of press interviews. I was so nervous. I was wow. like, oh, hope I sound like you an hide it so well. Person. What. Oh gosh, thank you. And you've never done any media training or anything? No. Wow. Theater. Theater darling. <laughs> <laughs> Theater darling, yeah. <laughs> um Bernard says, when you recorded Lady D, you said in an interview you had no idea Resident Evil was such a huge franchise. Probably my our interview. Did you get caught off guard in BG as well with the fandom? Ah. I, so I knew Resident Evil was a big franchise, but what I didn't know was that my character within that franchise would be a big deal. I always knew the game would be a big deal, but I did not expect 
because you weren't the final villain or anything. Me. It, you know, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So I never expected it to facilitate my career in the way that it did. Um, I knew it'd be a nice shiny credit to have, and it would be really cool, but I didn't expect it to literally change my life. Um, yeah. In terms of Baldur's Gate three, I I'm not a gamer, so I think. On all counts, I think I'm always surprised. Yeah. It's when... hard to know what's going to hit and what's not as well. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to know. Mm. But I think also if you're going into a project with an eye on the outcome, it's never going to be as successful. I don't think you can really Correct. think about what's going to happen after release. You can only think about the things that you have control over, which are your work as a creative and as an actor. So the only things I think about when I'm working on a project or try to think about, cause it's hard, obviously these things, now that I'm publicly in the industry, uh, people know who I am. There's, there's more, there's definitely lots more outside pressure. Um, when I was working on Lady D, I was anonymous. So didn't have any concept of the larger stakes. Now I do have a concept of the larger stakes. Um, but I think when you are working on a character, you have to put all of that aside and you just have to work in service of the story. How can I best serve the story? It's not about you, it's about the story. How can I make that the best that it can possibly be? By the way, this is this is a random question, but how is Beyonce? <laughs> now i know that dan is a stalker and oh my god she was amazing but we went on her birthday we went on beyonce's birthday and saw her in concert oh. diana ross came out and it's sang a special Happy one birthday. Yeah. we were in the nosebleeds let's not put a shine on it we had an obstructed view uh, we were all the way, way back somewhere, <laughs> looking mostly at a screen. That's sometimes the best spot, though, isn't it? But we had fun. We knew. Mm. We picked up the tickets super last minute because we found stuff that was not inaccessibly expensive. And yeah. we were like, look, we're going to have, it's freaking Beyonce. We're going to have fun regardless of where we're at. Um, and we had a blast. We just danced around. It was super fun. I'm guessing she's good live, right? <sighs> It, she's not uh, human. I don't. Oh, really? I think yeah. she's not human. Her yeah, voice. She's reversed. Yeah. She's gone. Yeah. She's Benjamin buttoned it this whole time, and it's unfair. It's upsetting. <laughs> <laughs> who are some other? Who, who is she up there for you? Who Who else would you want to see in concert that you haven't? I, to be quite honest, I don't go see a lot of artists in concert, and I have very rarely done major artists like Beyonce, I'll typically do more smaller yep. venue. Same here, concerts. yeah. But it's fun when you have the chance to go off and, and do that. So I don't know if I have another major artist that's on my list. Mm. If somebody knocks on my door tomorrow and hands me tickets to, I don't know, I think Ed Sheeran is coming next to LA, then sure, <laughs> hell yeah, I'll go. It'll be a blast. It'll be super fun. Um, uh. Yeah. So what was your question? <laughs> <laughs> oh God. <laughs> no, you answered it. It's all good. Okay. Um anonymous Beyonce was great. Yeah. Full stop. <laughs> anonymous here says, What did you do to get in the mindset of a character so unhinged? I guess we touched on that a little bit, but I think I always go back and start with text. That's the foundation of where I pull all of my ideas from yeah and then i i also think and this is tied to my background doing shakespeare and what my training is it is in you feel something when you say things aloud because again our bodies are intaking and receiving information that we're not even cognizantly aware of so i really like to get things on its feet quite quickly even if i'm just reading the script in front of me, I'll kind of stand up and move and see what the language as I'm saying it wants me to physicalize in my body. And that can be a kind of key in for me. Um, yeah. You, you, you love the movement aspect as well, the physicality. I do. Yeah. I do. I work 
quite physically. That was a discovery from grad school. I think prior to grad school, I was very analytic and text focused and kind of maybe relied on that to as a to a point of fault where oh, I just okay. wanted to dive into text and analysis and look at, oh, well, she said this word instead of that word, which means this, 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 and this, and then, and create these elaborate backstories of, well, she must have, uh, I don't even know, had a bad orange that morning <laughs> that made her grumpy and then made her say X, Y, Z. And I've found as I got older and started working more on craft, that that ultimately was unhelpful. It got me too much in my head. And then I felt like I was manufacturing and overthinking. Whereas if I kind of quickly got on my feet, then it made the choices that I was making feel a lot more organic and supported that it was, it was real and not manufactured. It was, it was stuff that I was actively receiving from the words. Do you still, yeah. you, so you, you find that Shakespeare background really valuable, I'm guessing, don't you? You really, that's come in handy a lot. I think so. Part of my going to grad school, I went to college and I majored in theater and they had a great program, but I think throughout college and throughout most of my life, really, I was always kind of one foot in the door and one foot out the door with acting. I really struggled to decide and whether or not this is what I actually wanted to do with my life, with my What career. else were you contemplating, may I ask? I didn't have anything specific in mind. Okay, you just like, weren't all I full in. To... Yeah. I wasn't all in. There were mm. things about it I liked. There were things about it I didn't like. I really loved the craft and the yeah. work of an actor. But then, you know, some of the outer social trappings were not my bag. Um, the kind of competition that can happen to even just get the work. I just wasn't sure if I wanted yeah. to invest myself into that world. And I think so often actors, especially young actors are like, this is the only thing I can do. And I'm that's a disservice. You're smart, you're wonderful beings. You can do a lot of things. And I felt that I could do a lot of different things. I was very capable and smart. And you know, if I wanted to go achieve somewhere else, I could. And I did do that for a while. When I graduated college, I, I got quote unquote real people jobs and then ultimately yep. realized that I was still dissatisfied and came back to acting and made the conscious choice so that then it was like, yeah, I could do a lot of different things, but I actively choose each and every day to pursue acting because it is the hardest thing I could possibly do. I always have loved a challenge and so that was a conscious choice that I had to make. And once I made that choice, I felt because I'd taken some time away and even in college, you know, it was a li I, I loved liberal arts because I got to investigate so many different things and take a lot of different classes. But what I loved about grad school that I realized was such a privilege is that I just focused on acting 24 seven you don't get to do that in life, even now as a professional, you're, mm. you're doing your day-to-day -day admin and your business stuff. You're an entrepreneur really as an actor, you're running a business. And so my nine to five is the day-to-day -day operations of my business. And then when I book a job, that's what I call my vacation. I get to go on really? vacation yeah. and, that's interesting. and yeah. do whatever, but yeah. And so part of grad school, what interested me about Shakespeare, I also, I come from a music background as well. I'm a singer. So the voice and hindsight has always been the cornerstone of my work as an actor, I think. And there was something about the musicality within Shakespeare that interested me even in college. And then the thought of pursuing it in grad school, again, I love a challenge. And I felt like well, if you can learn how to do Shakespeare, you can learn how to do anything. You can be a goddamn actor if you know how to do mm. Shakespeare. And so I went out and I did it and I decided to choose the hardest thing and do that. And I do think it certainly provides a lot of value. It certainly influences a lot of the way that I work and operate as an actor today. I don't know if I would have been as set up for success with Lady D if I had not done that program, I was fresh off the heels of that program. And a lot of the work that we did there in terms of this physicality, animal work, lobbing, I brought those principles with me directly into the volume. And I just felt like, you know, luck happens when preparation meets opportunity. I was so prepared 
I had put in my 10,000 hours. So then when a moment of luck happened or when this opportunity came my way, then luck was able to strike and really blossom into this amazing career. So that's what happened there. To answer your question, yes, I I find my Shakespeare training to be quite valuable. That's not going to be the same for everyone. Every actor is different. And I think as an actor, a lot of the work really is about self knowledge. You have to work on your sense of self and what makes you unique. The thing that makes me unique, what I can offer as an actor is my vocal training. I think that's the cornerstone of what I do. I have a lot of flexibility. I have a lot of dexterity with my voice that comes from my background as a singer. It means I have a really highly trained ear so I can mimic sounds and uh, I understand pacing. I feel in my body if pacing is not quite right. So that's what makes me unique. And so those are the things that I bring with me. And I think Shakespeare uh, functions really nicely in tandem with all of that. It it complements everything that I was doing before is complemented by what I did over here that then sets me up for success over there. So you just have to find the thing that's unique for you. It's I'm not saying everyone go out and study, no, no. Shape, although do yeah. it for sure, because it's helpful. But it helps. Yeah. Yeah. That was my path. And now you find yours. And you mentioned you love a challenge. What what's been the biggest challenge since you were, you know, pushed into this limelight a little bit with Lady D in the last few years? What have you found the biggest challenge of it all? I actually think the biggest challenge has been being in the spotlight for me. Mm. Part of the appeal of voiceover is that you're a little bit more anonymous, but my first role in the field of voiceover and video games made me very much not anonymous. <laughs> I was thrust into the spotlight in a real way. So then it's coming to terms with that new public face that you are this public figure and you could um, be recognized at any point. Yeah. I am right. Rec- yeah. And I am. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. And the stakes are high. You want to do service to the fans they, it, the character also, all of these characters, Lady D in particular, but, uh, you know, all of them, they mean so much to people. So for yeah. me, it always feels like the stakes are quite high because these characters mean so, so much. Lady D, I think, changed a lot of people's lives and inspired a lot of people. Oh, 100%. To have that as a legacy, to do yeah. service to that legacy is uh, a big value point for me. I think we might look back and as a big turning point that that character, don't you think? I think it's a really, it's going to be iconic if it isn't already. I mean, in 10, 20 years, we'll be looking back yeah. going, wow. Um, I'll give you a couple more questions. Did you, this is from Tiny Flair. Did you feel a shift in your behavior after voicing some of the lines for Oren? You mean, did I take my work home with me? <laughs> <laughs> did I go around murdering and stabbing Yeah, people? did you go around murdering and shape-shifting, Not basically? You know. I had to. I had to leave that. You'll question. never know. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, shit. Do, 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 do. Oh, that's funny. I don't, I no, don't know. The answer's I hope no, not. Maybe. <laughs> the answer's no. Uh, beardless man, how did you manage to get the line Yes, sir. No, sir. Rip and cut your throat, sir, to flow so smoothly. Literally don't remember it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Um, yeah, you're recording just hundreds of lines <laughs> a day. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I don't know. But good to know that whatever I did worked. So thank you. Also, beardless man. Sometimes when you read out the usernames, I know. I wonder, did they pick something specifically to make us chuckle? I appreciate I it. I think they do, really. I love it. I think the weirder, the better. Uh, Mischief, 1995. Just completed the boss fight last night. Maggie, you did a fantastic job. 10 out of 10. Aw, thanks. That's very nice. Raven, who bites better, Lady D or Astarian, darling? Oh, goodness me. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to say Neil because he's so cheeky. I think he'd bite better, meaning you'd have a better experience overall. Lady D is going to kill you. Lady a D will slice you to ribbons. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, your work is incredible, Maggie. Did recording Oren leave you physically nauseous at all? Ooh. From Solus Unit. I don't know if I felt nauseous, but I, I mean, I was definitely sweaty. Yeah. It's definitely very sweaty. You're put, you're working really hard. You're doing a lot. And, uh, you know, it's not a good look. You're there. <laughs> you just like, everything's chaos. So no, I, I, the stuff she does is nauseating for sure. Um, and I think I was sweating cause I was feeling very intensely. <laughs> Why why am I here? Why did you bring me on to answer a question so ineloquently? This is awful. No, no, you've been fantastic. Uh sure, sure that's is this really Maggie Robertson or is Oren no. fucking with us again? Oh. <laughs> it's all that's the big twist. Yeah, that, if <laughs> I had the budget for this show, I would do something like that where we just That'd be turn you. Uh, um, her little head crack thing that she does oh so that's so oh that man I, I get chills for that oh it's horrible it's horrible they showed yeah. me some of the previs for that and that was nauseating so yeah some of the stuff they told me that she would do when she's transformed and looking like other people that was nauseating to hear yeah. about all her things that she does i was like oh god <laughs> Uh, this is slightly spoilers, guys, if you want to skip a minute. Uh, AK, how early on did you learn about Oren's insecurities regarding her mother? And Very early on. Yeah. Very early on. So I got there on day dot and had a conversation with the writer, Adrian Law, and uh, the rest of the team, Tom, Greg, everyone, and got the rundown on Oren and her background and help i do think that helps understand. yeah they said did that affect the performance basically yeah yeah because that's what allowed me to realize that she how how spoilery can i be should i say it yeah I'll no say, please we've we've already given a warning yeah the fact that she had to murder her own mother in order to just stay alive her mom was trying to kill her and she had to murder her in order just to have the right to live that's horrible and that <laughs> I think would fuel yeah. a major distrust throughout many all of the relationships in her life can you ever trust anyone again when the one person in your life who's supposed to love you unconditionally literally tried to slice your throat <laughs> so yeah, I think that's a lot of, that's why I landed on this kind of heartbreaking image of just this broken little girl. She was just mm -hmm. broken and she was young. That stuff stays with you. That's trauma. Um, she's morphed it into, I think now her superpower, which is this kind of joie de vivre with which she approaches violence because she was rewarded for violence from a very young age. So um, yeah. I, yeah, it helped yeah. a lot. It was so influential. So, so influential. That's last a huge one. trail, that bond. Mm. Oh, anyway. I know. I know. Uh, last one from the fans. Are you okay with giving me trust issues in BG3? I'm not sure if anyone, I'm not sure anyone is who they are. Uh, yeah, I, I'm okay with it. <laughs> <laughs> also, Dan, I thought you were going to stop with, are you okay? <laughs> and then you continued on and i was gonna be like no definitely not but, yeah i can stop there if you want are you okay maggie <laughs> uh. no are, oh, is anyone yeah and then the last one was there was one more are you bummed out there was no you you weren't romanceable i'm sure you've heard this before everyone wanted have... you to be romance well i don't think it works yeah. in the context of the story uh, but yeah. That's where I land on it as well. I think yeah. it would not have served, it would not be true to the character and it would not have served the story. I don't- It would be a bit silly. It would be too silly at that point, you know? The only love of Oren's life is violence. Yeah. That's it. So I think it would really do her a disservice if she was, but I fully understand and support people's attraction to her. Yeah. Yeah. Safe to say she's kind of hot. Yeah. 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 
Um, Maggie, thank you so much for taking the time. Is there anything you wanted to say to the fans? Ah! <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I think I'll just say probably what I've said a million other times, but I, it's true every time, which is that I'm so grateful of their support. And it's been really exciting to see how they've come with me on this journey that, you know, we're kind of on it together. We are coming up from the bottom and now we're here and uh, just seeing what else this world has to throw with us, throw at us. And um, yeah. I can see as you slowly answer it, you're going, what the fuck am I saying? What am I saying? You're, you're hilarious, man. Oh, God. You know, an actor oh. prepares, and then when you act me, you ask me to come up with things on the spot, I'm not a writer. I've seen you do improv. <laughs> you're actually really good. What improv? Where? How? I saw you do improv at a, at a con. Oh. I saw a video, yeah? You remember that with Neil? I think you were with Neil. That was at... Yeah. Uh, Is it Insomnia? Yes, Yep. That was that insomnia. The fun backstory of that is that it was so difficult to hear each other on stage. Oh no. I was responding. I was kind of, I hope that's what they said. Oh shit. That's even harder. Response. So the oh. whole time we all got off stage and we were like, what? What just happened? <laughs> I blacked out. I couldn't hear anything. And nobody could hear shit. And then we had so many people throughout the weekend that would come up to our tables and be like, great job at the show. And we're like, was it? Because we have no idea what happened. <laughs> oh, so. man. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. Shit. Yeah. 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 Fake it till you make it. <laughs> <laughs> How have you found, and you've done a lot of consents. Have you found them all with the, you know, the Lady D? people that come up, get emotional. How do you process that? Um, They're really fun. It's really fun. I think the cosplays, seeing people's creativity around this character, characters and this character in particular, one yeah. of the fun things about art in general, and I think really specifically within video games, because the fan base is so avid and so engaged that, you know, once you create something and it's out into the world, the audiences get to define their relationship to it and they get to broaden or deepen our understanding of this character or decide what the character means for them. That could be different from how we intended, but it's no less valid if that's how it resonated to you. So it's been really exciting to see all of the different creative interpretations when it comes to cosplay, um, fan art, fan fiction, all of the above. And as you said she means so much to people. She really, I think, changed people's lives and was a figure that they um, really resonated with and looked up to, lol, um, in a lot of ways. Literally. And so, literally and figuratively. <laughs> so, yes, I think, you know, I think the stakes for me always feel really high. I want to do service to that. I want to give them an experience that is worthwhile. I know the lines at cons are always so long and you're yeah. waiting in the hours and so to come to the table and only get a few seconds with the person that you waited in line for I want to provide something more than that to my fans because they've given me so much I would not be in the position that I am if it were not for the way that Lady D was received by the fans I would not be going to comic cons in the first place I wouldn't have this career so I think that's how you get the energy but yeah, that's really the energy. We're yeah. really tied to each other. I think we're we're really interconnected. It's a symbiotic relationship in that way. And can you, before we go, can you please pitch to Capcom a Lady D game? I mean, it, it's a no brainer. I like, don't have I, control. I don't have that kind of power. I know, the, but you got to just have just call them up power. and write. We'll write a script. Oh, I'll I just, mean, yeah, <laughs> I'll call them up. Definitely have their number, <laughs> direct line. <laughs> Uh, hello at capcom.com. Hi, I am Maggie. I want a Lady D game, please. Please. Uh, <laughs> pretty please. <laughs> uh, I think they have to do it eventually. They can't. There's got to be more story to tell. I tell you what, it's such a good character. And yeah, hopefully one day, hey? Yeah. Yeah. Knock on wood. Thank you, Maggie. Can make it happen. If anyone can make it happen. Oh, I know. I know. Thank you so much, Maggie. Um, so you're doing a couple of signings and anything else we should look out for? 
Oh gosh, thank you so much for remembering to plug the things that I need to plug for me. <laughs> yes, uh, we have a wonderful Baldur's Gate cast reunion uh, live signing event that we're gonna do with streamily.com. Cool. Um, it's gonna be wonderful. I think most of the cast is in London, but it'll just be, I think it's just me and Matt Mercer that are here based in LA. So we'll just go hang out and do the live signing together and answer some fan Q and A's. And then you can purchase prints from each of us for our characters. If you want, uh, you can find that on my shop page, which is www.streamly.com slash Maggie Robertson. You've got some really cool prints too. I mean, these artists, you've been very lucky, Maggie. Like Lady D is probably the best art I've ever seen for a character. And then oh, yeah. again, some with Oren are so good. Oh. Well, both of those characters, just to tout the game designers a little bit, they're so physically interesting and unique. And I said this about Lady D at the time, and I'm going to say it about Oren as well, is that she exudes character. Even yeah. just looking at her, you already have a sense of who she is, how she carries herself. So it's excellent fodder for artists across all platforms. I think <laughs> it's really yeah. exciting. There's a lot of there's a lot of ways that they can play with that. I just saw really cool cosplay that was awesome of Orin with her kind of, uh, you know, her. That's skin. a tough cosplay, isn't it? It's really I find yeah. it quite tough, but they really pulled it off. It was awesome. Wow. And so you're doing more signings, Maggie. More uh, signings. <laughs> uh, yeah, but this will be fun. No, it's nice no. to plug Baldur's Gate, and I hope yeah. to do some more big cons coming up as well. Beautiful. Uh, I do have a con coming up next weekend at Retropalooza in Texas. Oh, nice. But people probably won't attend that because this won't come out in time. So Baldur's Gate no, no. signing. <laughs> we'll get it out. We'll get it out. Don't oh, worry. okay. We'll get this out. Um. And you got to get them down to Australia too. Hopefully they'll bring you down. I would love to also. I know this is New Zealand, but it's a hop, skip, and a jump away. I'm a huge Lord oh. of the Rings fan. So oh. that is at the top of my bucket list. You would love New Zealand, Maggie. It is a magical place. I love it. I'm dying so, to go. You have that to is go. One of my all time places I need to go. You got to go yeah. to Hobbiton. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but also i mean similar comic cons that's very fan dependent so if if you guys want me to show up at a con near you let your con organizers know yeah that's the best thing you can do beautiful yeah. before i let you go maggie can uh Oren yes. the red is there any way she can say something to dan to round oh, this out God. <laughs> i should have known you would ask me this um <laughs> She gets a little golem -y, doesn't she? With the piece of it. It feels a little like Gollum. Um, <laughs> I don't know about that, but maybe you're well, channeling it in your own mind. <laughs> that's not Gollum. And fun fact, I met oh. Sean Astin at a con and he knows oh. Twitter. And that's oh, wow. a crowning achievement, quite honestly. Awards, Sean Astin, yes. <laughs> that's awesome. I actually love um, him in uh, Fifty First Dates. Have you seen that movie? Uh, yes, of course I have. Uh, oh, he's brilliant. I could tell people at the con that I was at, I could definitely tell people's ages because I had this young group of people that came up to me and they were like, did you know Sean Astin is here? And they were like, yeah, oh my God, Fifty First Dates, right? <laughs> that was the first go-to, not Rudy. Yeah, it wouldn't be the first go-to. Lord but, of the yeah. Rings. <laughs> <laughs> what am I doing here? Let All right. Um, I'll let you focus. Do you want me to address it to you? Please. <laughs> Damn. I itch to peel you, to split your skin, to see your skull shine in the light. <laughs> <laughs> I've got shivers. Man. Oh, that is a disturbing character. And there's just something about that delivery you you've actually nailed the delivery that was similar to the really to the game oh, yeah excellent wow <laughs> season professional oh, look at uh, thank you maggie yeah. make sure to follow maggie if you're not already and it is a pleasure to chat with you maggie hopefully we can do this again for a third time yeah here's to the next big release <laughs> <laughs>